Uh, we're doing a little bit of a hard right turn now, and uh, really the second half of the afternoon now, the second half of the day, our afternoon is really going to be um, we'll focused on different topics, and the first one's going to be on drinking water. But before we get to that, it's uh, we're going to have our keynote address. So it's my pleasure to be introducing uh, Dr. David Sedlak. Um, he's from UC Berkeley. Uh, he's chair of the Civil and Environmental Engineering uh, Department there. He's also the, um, if I can get it right, the, uh, well, he's, a he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Um, he's received many, many awards. He's the author of the book, uh, Water 4.0, which I started reading recently. I'm about halfway through, I'm really enjoying it. Um, and he's also the Plato and I'll get it wrong, but uh, Maslow's an off uh, professor uh, within his department. It's a really true honor for him to be here. Uh, and as it turns out, the draw to get him here is that he's a Long Island native, so grew up in Oyster Bay. Uh, but it's our distinct honor to have Dr. Sedlak here as our keynote speaker. So please uh, give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Actually, the, the, the draw was I could get to see my friends Bruce and Ann, and that was really nice also. Um, so um, I feel free to keep eating lunch. I, I've given evenings talks at times, and the difference between giving a lunchtime talk and an after-dinner talk is that uh, most of people are not drunk, so that's good uh, here. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll take eating is just fine. Um, so um, I wanted to, to thank... Chris and Jinwei and the organizers for having me here. It's a great privilege to come back to Long Island after being away so long. Um, I wanna tell you about what I do every morning when I wake up, um, not as early as I woke up today, uh, but um, every morning when I wake up, I think about revolutions. I think about urban water revolutions and how they come about and which ones are gonna happen next as we move into the future. And I blame some of this need to think about urban water revolutions to the fact that I grew up here on Long Island. Uh, because when I grew up on Long Island, I was focused on, I was motivated to study water for some of the same reasons that we heard about this morning. I was concerned about the quality of water in Long Island Sound. Um, I was concerned about uh, chemicals that might be in the water supply because we have this vulnerable sole source aquifer. And I went and studied water chemistry and water quality with that in mind. And then I ended up getting a job on the West Coast. And the world was completely different because in addition to thinking about water quality, people thought about water quantity. And one of the first things I ran into as I started thinking about water quantity was this crazy idea in Southern California that you could attach the wastewater treatment plant to the drinking water treatment plant and recycle the wastewater. And as an environmental chemist, I was just kind of blown away by that idea because I knew from people who'd been studying chemicals in wastewater that this would be a concern that, that you might be reintroducing things into your water supply that could make you sick. But at the time, no one was really thinking about that because the kinds of contaminants that were regulated in wastewater were not really an issue for drinking water. You weren't going to find PCBs in the drinking water. You probably wouldn't find TCE in wastewater at high concentrations, so they weren't thinking about it. And I thought I should think about that. And that became my initial research at Berkeley, studying things like uh, steroid hormones and pharmaceuticals and all these other compounds that you might find in wastewater and that might show up in water recycling. And I, because this became kind of a hot button issue, it was kind of the PFAS of its day, if you will. Um, I got asked to go to a lot of public meetings and talk to citizens groups and explain this process of water recycling. And I realized that I didn't really understand why we ended up with this crazy system that we have for obtaining water and treating water and recycling water and why we didn't do things that were just much more logical. And I think we see that today, like, well, how do we get in this situation where we're relying on septic, septic tanks for treating wastewater when we could have done something differently from the beginning? And people who think of who are faced with centralized water systems uh, think about how do we end up with this sewer that collects the stormwater and the wastewater and mixes it and causes 
combined sewer overflows every time it rains. And I set out to try to understand the systems that we ended up with. And the result of that exploration, this goes. I think everyone's having the same problem here, huh? Yeah. The, 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 the result of this was this book that I ended up writing called Water 4.0. And Water 4.0 was my attempt to try to educate myself on how we got the water systems that we have today and to explain to people why we're facing the challenges we're facing and what's going to happen in the future. And when I started writing the book, I didn't have a title for it because I didn't know how it would turn out. But it turns out that water systems undergo a constant set of gradual changes until they can no longer meet the needs of their communities and then a revolution happens. It's almost like the, the punctuated equilibrium idea of evolution that suddenly things get things change very quickly and not on this incremental way anymore. And that's really the basis of water 4.0. So I talked about the four revolutions in water systems Water 1.0, or the first revolution in water, where people started building centralized water systems. So if you think about the Romans or, uh, or the ancient Persians or people in Japan and China, when cities reached a certain density, the local water supply could no longer provide people with enough water to meet their needs. So they came up with creative ways to import water from long distances. And I talked about uh, the Roman aqueducts that could produce uh, uh, equivalents to the amount of water that we use in our cities today, something like 400 liters per person per day, were flowing into Rome from those aqueducts. And that created a revolution because it allowed people to live in dense populations in cities. And that revolution was rediscovered during the Industrial Revolution and allowed cities like uh, Berlin and Paris and New York and Los Angeles and Las Vegas to exist based upon imported water from long distances. The second revolution in water was drinking water treatment. As more and more people moved to cities, uh, the waste from upstream communities contaminated the drinking water supply of downstream communities. People got sick with diseases like cholera and typhoid fever. And so it was necessary to find a way to treat that stuff after it got out in the environment. And the way in which we did that was by building drinking water treatment plants that employed filtration and chlorine disinfection to, uh, to prevent waterborne diseases. And in a period of about 20 years, in the early uh, part of the 20th century, uh, we basically alleviated the worries in wealthy countries that drinking tap water would make you sick with these diseases. So that was also a revolution. The third revolution in water systems was the recognition that all of the sewage coming out of our cities was contaminating our waterways. I think we saw that in, in New York City, but we, we've seen it in the Great Lakes and we've seen it in, in the Rhine River and all over the world. And at a certain point, the way that we were trying to address this problem wasn't good enough. And so a social revolution happened. You know, people were frustrated in the late 1960s by uh, not only the dying of the Great Lakes and many of our estuaries, but they were also concerned with things like, uh, like DDT and PCBs and all of the other environmental problems they were seeing. So a revolution happened where we adopted a technology that had been developed 50 or 60 years before activated sludge and trickling filters, and we upgraded our sewage treatment plants and it was a revolution because in a course of about 20 years, we achieved the goal of making many of the nation's waters fishable and swimmable again, and that was a revolution. So for me, Water 4.0 was the revolution that I was encountering in the west and southwestern part of the country. I was seeing it happening in places like Singapore and parts of Australia uh, and other parts of the Mediterranean. It was this idea that when we no longer have enough water and we can't rely on importing more water from a distance, we would close the loops on our urban water cycle by capturing the storm water that flowed in our city streets, by taking the wastewater and recycling it, and sometimes even by desalinating seawater as kind of a non-traditional water source. And that became the basis of Water 4.0, and, and you could read about it or take the book out of the library or whatever you need to do uh, to see it. But, um, but that was where I got to with Water 4.0. And for me, 
writing that book was probably one of the, the highlights of my career because it got me outside of my comfort zone and it allowed me to meet people and have conversations about things that I'd never thought about before. And oftentimes I'd have this question like, well, how does water 4.0 uh, apply to the crisis in agricultural water needs? Or how does war, water 4.0 apply to the sustainable development goals? And I would tell people, gee, I don't know, because I wrote a book about people, wealthy people living in cities struggling to provide enough water. I didn't write a book about those things because I didn't know enough about them. Well, the pandemic hit and I had some free time on my hands. So I thought I'd try to figure out some things about those. And my pandemic project, uh, you know, some people play guitar or take up painting. Uh, my pandemic project has been to write another book. And the book that I've been writing, um, which I think has a tentative title, Water for All, talks about how there's not just one crisis. When people talk about uh, water crises, they're actually talking about what I consider to be six different crises and they don't distinguish between them. So it tends to confuse us. And so when people say there's a water crisis out there, you should ask them which one. So for me, the one that I wrote about in Water 4.0 was water for the wealthy, the one in the upper left corner. But there are two other water scarcity crises that are very important. On the far right there, there's water for the poor. This is the one you hear about when you hear about the sustainable development goals, you hear about uh, all the people, it's about 800 million people who lack uh, access to basic water services. But there's another crisis in there, which is water for the many. And that's the majority of people on earth that's somewhere around uh, four or five billion people who live in places where they might have access to basic water services that is piped water. But unlike us, their water is not safe to drink because of intermittent pressurization or uh, high costs to achieve it, to obtain it. And so they uh, struggle with things like needing to boil their water, or they often have a crisis of water affordability. But in addition to those three crises, there are three other crises. One is water for health. There's a picture here of, uh, of, of someone using a, a hand pump to take water out of a well in Bangladesh. And we've all heard about the crisis of arsenic uh, in Southeast Asia, naturally occurring arsenic, a problem that was exacerbated by a, a well-intentioned effort to uh, protect people from waterborne pathogens. But it's not just that crisis, it's the PFAS crisis that we'll hear about today. It's, uh, it's the one for dioxane crisis. It's all the other things that makes water uh, unsafe to drink and probably somewhere around uh, at least a half a billion people on earth suffer from having tap water, but water that's not safe to drink. The, the fifth of these six crises is water for food. Um, obviously, if you don't have food, uh, if you don't have water, enough water, you can't grow enough food, but that's not really the problem because food is a global commodity and it moves across borders. Probably the larger concern is if you don't have enough food, you don't have a dynamic agricultural economy and that causes chaos and crises in places where they run out of water. Like for example, in parts of India, uh, in parts of North Africa and increasingly parts of uh, places like the Western United States and the Murray Darling uh, Valley in Australia. And finally, because nature always bats last, water for ecosystems. Not only the question of having enough water for an ecosystem is shown here in the picture of the Aral Sea drying up, but also the issue of pollution of ecosystems. So we've been talking about uh, Long Island Sound and hypoxia, but hypoxia is a global problem. And we know about the dead zone in the Gulf of uh, Mexico and many of the other dead zones around the world. And so when we think about these kinds of water problems, there's a distinction I want to make between a problem and a crisis. When there's a water problem, we usually respond by water evolution. So most of the time we're thinking about, can we achieve a standard? Can we deliver enough water for a, a slowly growing community? And that involves an evolution of a water system. So a water evolution involves gradual improvements in the performance of a system. So when you look towards optimization of an existing approach for uh, sewage treatment, for example, or drinking water treatment, that's evolution. If you look only towards existing technologies and existing approaches, that's evolution. 
Um, and when you work within the frameworks of existing institutions and you say to yourself, we couldn't possibly create a new institution to manage this problem, it's too politically complex, that's water evolution. I think this morning we heard some revolutionary ideas, bioextraction, uh, uh, creating uh, organizations that would manage distributed uh, waste treatment systems, septic tanks, things that we wouldn't have talked about before. So I think here in Long Island, we're teetering on the edge of revolution. But I think in the larger context of the global six water crises, we're going to face a series of water revolutions over the next 20 years. And the way in which we respond to them is going to say a lot about the livelihoods of many people and the frequency with which we encounter these water crises in the future. Why do I think that's the case? Well, this is one reason when I think globally about uh, water revolutions, why we can expect more water revolutions in the future. And these are the 12 wonderful figures that encapsulate uh, the great acceleration. If you've never heard the term, the great acceleration in the literature describing the Anthropocene, this tremendous transformation that started in about 1950, these kind of figures show you what's gone on. It's been an incredible time for humanity. It's been unprecedented in human history that we've gone from uh, through a period of incredible population growth, but with that population growth, we've seen industrialization. And that industrialization has made people wealthier, but as it's made people wealthier, it's put more and more demands on resources. Well, it might seem like we've ended the end of industrialization, but the world is only about halfway there. And we're really at an inflection point as a society in thinking about this great acceleration because all exponential uh, processes have to have an inflection point and they have to slow down. They can't go on forever. So when we have discussions about greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, it's part of the same discussion as the driving forces behind water scarcity and water pollution. They're driven by the same thing, tremendous population growth and industrialization. So maybe Europe and North America and Japan have slowed down, but um, certainly the BRICS countries are still growing and after them we'll see Sub-Saharan Africa uh, grow in population and put additional stresses on the world. That's one reason why I think we'll have water revolutions. The second reason I think we're going to see more re revolutions in our future is climate change. Here's Lake Shasta, California. Uh, uh, this is a picture from 2015, but it could be a picture from this year because it's not just California, it's the entire western part of the United States is undergoing a process that uh, the hydrologists and meteorologists are starting to refer to as aridification. So it's not just a drought anymore. This is the new normal as rising temperatures and changing uh, circulation patterns mean less water available for people. And it's gonna drive crises, not only in the Western United States, but we see crises in places like uh, Brazil and Australia and China and India and, uh, and, and, and Europe. And these will come in the future. And so I think that means we're gonna face more water revolutions because the change is gonna happen faster than our institutions can adapt. And so a water revolution is a transformative process. I showed you three that have already happened, the first three water revolutions and the fourth one that's happening now. Um, it, it's driven by crisis. It requires new and reliable technologies. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And even if society's not ready to adapt, adopt some of the out of the box solutions, they have to be ready when the crisis hits. They have to be reliable enough when that happens. So don't get discouraged if people don't take up your great ideas immediately. And they permanently change institutions. So when you think about a revolution, when you're a revolutionary, don't worry if someone tells you, well, the Clean Water Act will never allow that. Because when the crisis comes, they're going to take that Clean Water Act and, and grind it up and, and rethink it. So what I've been working on for my pandemic project is writing a book explaining kind of what I've just told you and the way in which we deal with water today. And there are many different wonderful incremental approaches from water efficiency to, uh, to many different of the centralized water recycling processes that, um, that I've been working on and, and a whole host of different uh, alternative ways of solving crises. But I wanna talk to you uh, about some of the 
uh, maybe more frontier areas, some of the more intriguing areas to me that I think will support the revolution. And then I challenged myself to come and think about like how the revolution applies to Long Island, which is a little bit of a different revolution than what I've been thinking about these years. So first quiz for today, how many of you here watched the new movie Dune that came out last year? Okay. How many have read the book before? I'm gonna tell you about a still suit for a city. So if you didn't see Dune, you probably didn't, don't know what a still suit is, but if you didn't see Dune, I probably don't wanna to talk to you anyway. Um, okay, so a still suit is what you wear when you go down to the desert planet of Arrakis so you don't lose your precious bodily water. And it captures the moisture from your breath, it captures your urine, your sweat, and recycles it so you can drink it again. Um, NASA has something akin to a still suit in the space station, but the water costs something like $100,000 per liter. So we're not gonna build those kind of still suits here on earth anytime soon. Um, we'll only have to uh, go up to space for those, but there are cities that are creating still suits. And I wanna tell you about a city that's creating a still suit so you can see what I mean by it. And the city I wanna tell you about is, uh, is in Southern California. It's not really a city at all. It's kind of more like a, a suburban area like Long Island. It's the Long Island of Southern California. It's the Orange County. So Orange County in Southern California is a really interesting case study. And I, I actually think in terms of the watershed, the Santa Ana River watershed, it's home to about two and a half million people. It's located in a zone of Mediterranean climate. It only gets about 35 centimeters a year of water. So that, that's not a lot of precipitation, right? You're probably over a meter, a meter and a half here. So, so that's not a lot of water, but they have created a still suit where they have broken their reliance on imported water and declared water independence. How did they do it? Well, this is a figure showing you the recharge of the aquifer. So first I should tell you, Orange County, like Long Island, is, doesn't have any reservoirs. It, it's, it's almost entirely reliant upon groundwater. And there's a groundwater purveyor, the Orange County Water District, that manages the groundwater for that whole area. Um, and that area grew in the period after World War II, the, the Great Acceleration. And in the initial years, as the population increased, they overused their groundwater. So they overpumped the aquifers and they had saline intrusions coming into the coastal wells. And so the ways in which they fought that saline intrusion is this light blue color, this aqua color. They imported water from the Colorado River, like everyone else in Southern California, and they used it to recharge the aquifer. But by the early 1970s, because they were one of the last places to develop in Southern California, they had junior water rights and suddenly it became very difficult to do that. And so then they turned to capturing the base flow of the Santa Ana River. And I should tell you, the Santa Ana River is kind of the key to, to the first part of the story because the Santa Ana River is a river that comes from uh, inland and it flows directly through Orange County on its way to the, the ocean. It discharges at Huntington Beach, the, the place made famous by all those Beach Boys songs, you know, they're surfing. The Santa Ana River, uh, is a snowmelt fed river, it flows in the springtime. And what they did was they found ways to take water out of the river and put it in the sand quarries that they created to make all the concrete to build the suburbs. And they recharged the aquifer that way. And that got them uh, pretty far up until the mid 1990s when they ran into a couple of problems. First of all, the flow of the Santa Ana River started to decrease because upstream communities started using that water. But also those upstream communities started putting their sewage effluent into the river and it became an effluent dominated river. And the Santa Ana River Basin was also the home of Southern California's dairy industry. And so levels of nitrogen in that river water crept up and up. And they reached a point where the nitrate levels in the Santa Ana River were approaching this uh, magical 10 milligrams per liter nitrate that we talked about earlier this morning. And so the way in which they solved that problem was not by building a treatment plant, not by forcing their upstream neighbors and dairies to stop discharging, because that would have been politically difficult. They built the wetlands. 
This is the proto-constructed wetlands uh, cells that uh, uh, my colleague Alex Horn helped the Orange County Water District redesign. It's a, it's a flood control levee uh, or flood control dam. And behind it used to be some kind of ad hoc ponds where people used to hunt ducks. But when the nitrate levels in the Santa Ana River crept up, uh, Alex Horn and the Orange County Water District re-engineered that system. And you can see the dikes that were put in here to maximize the hydraulic residence time of the water in the wetland and the dense vegetation of wetland plants uh, that allowed them to uh, remove the nitrate by denitrification. So rather than hauling in wood chips, they grew the plants in situ. And then the wetland plants, after they died and senesced, they supported the denitrification. And they were able to avoid building a, 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 a nitrate removal facility on the river, which would have cost them hundreds of millions of dollars with a nature-based treatment system. Um, I came along in the mid-1990s and I got interested in pharmaceuticals and endocrine disruptors and I started studying these systems because I figured this would be an ideal way to remove these, these chemicals that were now the so-called emerging contaminants. We found that they didn't work very well um, at removing those compounds and, um, and we came up with an alternative. And this is the alternative that we came up with. It's something that, um, that I refer to as open water unit process wetlands or open water wetlands. And at the end of my talk, I have uh, references for papers for all these things. So don't worry if you, if you fall behind or if you wanna learn more, there will be opportunities later. Um, but what we did was we took advantage of the fact that many of these uh, pharmaceuticals and trace organic compounds were amenable to uh, photo transformation, they absorbed sunlight and they degraded when they were hit by sunlight. And that was kind of fun because there was some nice basic science to do there, but something else happened serendipitous in this process. And that was that on uh, what we did to make these open water wetlands, we realized that the, the constructed wetlands were not working well because of their poor hydraulics. So if you've ever been in a wetland, you know that wetlands tend to form channels and the water was channelizing and running through there and essentially short circuiting. So it's a nightmare of every engineer to have water short circuit through a unit process. And so we decided to get rid of the plants. So what we did was we put down a geotextile liner and kept the water shallow. So we got nice plug flow conditions and that was great for the photo transformation, but we inadvertently created conditions that were conducive to the growth of a photosynthetic diatom because someone was gonna use all that sunlight coming into the water. And that photosynthetic diatom and the microbial community that they created were great at denitrifying that water. And so we didn't give up on the denitrification ability of those open water wetlands. It turned out that we saw both the pharmaceuticals degrading, and you can see here the, the plot for atenolol on the left uh, uh, at three different hydraulic residence times, and then nitrate also degraded uh, in the system or was removed by denitrification. What you'll notice here too, is that the performance of these systems was best during the summertime. That makes sense, right? If it's, if it's photo transformation during the summertime when the sun's out, you get more photo transformation. Likewise, the nitrate removal was more robust in the summer because denitrification is temperature dependent in the wintertime it slows down. This was fortunate for us because uh, the Santa Ana River where the Prado wetlands are located is a perennial river in the winter time. The water's a lot cleaner because it's mainly snow melt. So the time that we wanted to get rid of the nitrate and the pharmaceuticals was in the summer when most of the flow was wastewater affluent. During the winter time, we had plenty of dilution water from the melting snow uh, that was coming in. There was a second problem though uh, in creating a still suit. So that, that helped fix the still suit for, uh, uh, for, for Orange County and, and their water supply. But there was a second problem in building the still suit for Orange County. And that was that the stormwater runoff within the city uh, was contaminated. And we'll hear about PFAS contamination today. I would say that Orange County is one of the, uh, the ground zeros for PFAS contamination. From, uh, from diffuse sources because there were many of them in the basin and the stormwater infiltrating into the ground has uh, contaminated them. And as our friends uh, in Los Angeles look to exploit the rainwater that falls within their city, they're rethinking their approach for using stormwater to recharge aquifers. And we've been working with them uh, to create uh, 
unit process systems to treat stormwater before it infiltrates. So if you're going to capture stormwater and infiltrate it into your aquifer, you better think about water quality. And so uh, working with, with my colleague, Dick Luthi at Stanford University, we've been developing these systems that take advantage of biochar and its ability to absorb compounds. And I've been building with my students uh, uh, an advanced oxidation process that uh, operates on only electricity collected with a solar collector. And so uh, we're able to have distributed systems treating stormwater. Now, when people, when I talk about Orange County, most people, the first thing they think about is the groundwater replenishment project, the project that has made uh, wastewater a thing of the past in Orange County. So Orange County no longer has wastewater. They have a water supply that's recycled and it's recycled through a two-stage process. Well, three-stage if you count microfiltration. Microfiltration removes the big stuff, but the two heavy lifters in the water recycling program is reverse osmosis, followed by UV peroxide and advanced oxidation process. And these, this multi-barrier approach, which we describe in this paper in uh, Accounts of Chemical Research, uh, shows that, it, that you can, uh, by having multiple different types of treatment methods that uh, work on different principles, you can assure that uh, wastewater can be cleaned to a point where it's as safe or even safer than most tap water. And so, uh, so, when we think about our still suit, Orange County has more or less closed its still suit in. It loses some water from the still suit through evapotranspiration, right? This is Southern California after all. You don't see as many green lawns and swimming pools as you used to, but those trees and shrubs that we plant still undergo evapotranspiration. So something like half the water that the water district delivers goes up into the atmosphere. And that's probably a good thing when you think about the urban heat island effect and the livability of the city. No one wants to live in, uh, in, in, in I hate to say it, Albuquerque, um, but um, you know, cactuses, rocks on the lawn, you, wanna, you want some plants around your house, right? Uh, but, and, and some of that is lost to runoff. There's some water that still goes out into the ocean and some of that groundwater is not recaptured by the water district. It goes into the regional aquifer, but about 50% of the water is recycled. And you could run through a similar calculation for places like Singapore, where the, the still suit is a little bit open because they have so much industrial water use, or Berlin, uh, where water flows out of the city but is largely a closed still suit. My second example I wanted to give you of kind of a water revolution is net zero water. I was tempted to call this still suit for a building, but I wanted to keep to the nomenclature that people are starting to talk about for buildings. So we hear of, of net zero energy buildings. A net zero water building is a building that doesn't need a municipal water supply and doesn't need a sewage disposal line. And that's pretty revolutionary. If you think about the need, like we talked today about like, well, why would we build centralized sewers and why would we need a water supply? That's how to realize the dream of on-site treatment. But I think the way to do it is with 21st century technology, not 19th century technology. So what we're struggling with here in Long Island is the fact that, uh, that the, the region Suffolk is supported by 19th century technology. Let's take a look at 21st century technology as it applies to water supply. I got interested in this topic because I, uh, I had a sabbatical visitor, uh, a professor from Ghent University, Cornel Rabai, came to see me in Berkeley and we spent a lot of, uh, a lot of beer tasting afternoons uh, uh, talking about personalized water systems and we ended up publishing a paper about it. But the idea was that if you had a house, so Cornel, when he built his house in, in Belgium, he was required to put in a rainwater harvesting system to offset some of his potable water use because uh, people don't realize this, but Belgium is the third most water scarce country in Europe after Cyprus and San Marino. Um, and it's because it's flat like here. Um, and, and so we talked about whether an individual house could have a closed loop water system and take care of all of its water use and what we realized was that between rainwater harvesting and gray water recycling, you could do this. But in the early days, it would be expensive. And I heard someone say this morning, kind of like uh, in the early days of Tesla or the early days of uh, all of these innovations. And that's the idea of a learning curve. So technologies tend to start out expensive. And as more units get, get uh, created, the prices come down and an industry develops. And we looked at this and said, why would someone 
want a personalized water system. We thought about some of the reasons beyond just it's efficient. Like for example, you could have softened water going into the washing machine and your clothes would be cleaned better. And if you want, if you crave the water uh, that tasted like the water you grew up with, you could program it in and the RO system would deliver the remineralized water that met your personal taste. And as you got older, you could supplement the water with calcium magnesium. So you didn't have to take pills to do that. And so this, I, this crazy idea grew and grew and we described it in this paper and put it out there to see how the community responded. And the community of serious engineers actually responded. Uh, some colleagues of ours from, uh, from, uh, from Spain and Irvine, California contacted us and we worked together on a paper that came out a few months ago in water research where we did an actual techno-economic analysis of what it would cost to build building scale water systems. And these building scale water systems that could meet 100% of the demand, it turns out that in Western Europe and North America, they pay for themselves already. So given the water tariffs that people pay uh, and the hookup fees that people pay for their buildings, uh, putting a gray water system in and putting a rainwater harvesting system is reached a point where it's economically attractive. And we did the analysis and asked questions under which climate conditions and which kinds of, uh, of operations does it make sense. And we also realized, and this is the part that's a little bit cheating, that in the early years, they would have the municipal water supply as a backup in case the rainwater tanks went dry, and they would have the municipal sewer system as a place to put their uh, residuals. Just like in the early days of solar panels, when you could hook up to the municipal electricity system for free, and no one charged you a surcharge. Um, so the idea of like a fully water independent building is still a little bit far fetched. That's why it's revolutionary. But halfway there already exists. You just have to go to the southern tip of Manhattan to see it. This is the Battery Park City project in New York, where about half of the water is recycled in the building through a gray water treatment system. And it paid for itself in about five or six years. And it got a subsidy from the city of New York, not because New York has water scarcity. We know that New York has a wonderful ample water supply, but because the, the, the building can, uh, can hold its bladder essentially. So on rainy days, it doesn't discharge the sewer system. So that's a credit to the city to prevent combined sewer overflows. There are a variety of other reasons. Everyone wants a green building in their city. So it was, uh, 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 pushed in that direction. But I think there are some ideas and enabling technologies that are coming about that are going to make these kinds of revolutions more likely. Um, I'm particularly interested in the idea of the 50 liter home. So there's a coalition, you can see the members of the coalition here, groups like uh, Kohler and P&G, and, and uh, I guess IKEA is part of it now, but the 50 liter coalition, home coalition, believes that we can drive down indoor water use to 50 liters per person per day. Now today, a water efficient house is somewhere around 50 gallons per person per day. But by doing things like installing recirculating showers and ultra low flow toilets and rethinking the way we make washing machines, suddenly the size of all of those modules and equipment needed to do in-building recycling have dropped by three quarters. So the kinds of buildings that are going to adopt this building scale water recycling are gonna be new construction. And when you do this new construction, you have an extra motivation to go for the next phase of water conservation. Now, I would have loved to have gone through the other, uh, the other innovations or revolutions with you. I'll just tell them what they are because it's a teaser. So you'll buy the book when it comes out. So the third one is the idea of a better salt machine. Um, what do I mean by a salt machine? Well, um, there is a huge supply of water that we're not tapping into uh, in inland areas. It's brackish groundwater. And because we don't know how to get rid of the salts after we desalinate, desalinating, it's easy. It's much cheaper, much less energy intensive than seawater desalination, which has already reached parity with other water sources. The problem is we can't do it. And so you see in the bottom corner, NAWI, this acronym, National Alliance for Water Innovation. This is the Department of Energy's $100 million investment in the next generation of desalination. And I, I'm fortunate enough to be part of the team doing that. What we're doing with the NAWI, one of our key ideas is to create a better salt machine. And by the way, this better salt machine, how many of you saw the story in the New York Times about, uh, about Salt Lake City? Did you see that? That was scary. Go, go back and read it if you had. It's drying up. 
The Salton Sea is drying up. All of these places where uh, salinization is affecting agriculture and creating ecological catastrophes could probably be treated with a better salt machine. The other one that I, I wrote about in the book and that I, I wish I had time to tell you about is this idea of running the rivers. I don't mean like getting in a raft and running the river. I mean, we run the rivers. We control the flow of rivers because we control the dams and reservoirs. And if we think about how to use nature as part of the storage system and the treatment system, we can make our water infrastructure a lot more efficient. But I don't wanna talk about that today. I wanna to talk about Long Island. Um, I came back home and I think it's an obligation when you go visit people and you come home to, to bring a gift from, from the place where, where you were. And so I, I wanna try to bring a small gift to you. I think you, you don't need much. You, you, you have a very gifted group of people to begin with. But I wanted to think about some of the Long Island challenges and how some of the things I've learned about water revolutions might play into addressing some of Long Island's challenges. And some of this was uh, uh, inspired by uh, an email conversation that I, I had with Bruce Brownwell over the past month or two. Um, and I wanna think about the challenges. And when I, I asked Bruce uh, what the, the challenges were, he said, there's only really one challenge you need to think about, and that's the contamination of groundwater by septic systems, mainly nitrate. And I thought about that one for a while. And I guess one of the things I wanted to offer, and it was, uh, it was thought about a little bit today, is this idea. Oftentimes we pose the challenge as centralized uh, sewered wastewater treatment and household scale. And in between is a continuum on a logarithmic scale of different types of ways to treat water. And so I want you to think about some of the things that I told you about building scale systems and some of the things that you might think about district scale systems where you could apply it to the parts of the aquifer or the parts of the watershed that are most vulnerable to nitrogen pollution and think about not just like it's sewered or it's not sewered, but you could say, well, maybe we need a system that treats the uh, 350 houses here, and maybe we could, could do that too. And I, I think from the ideas that I heard about this morning, some of these new uh, innovative uh, and alternative septic systems are going to be really hard to run at an individual homeowner scale. So maybe in the early days, you do try to do it for groups of 20 or 30 or 50 or these, these downtown areas where people are suffering because they can't uh, reuse the water. And I think I'd love to have a conversation with you about that. Um, the second Long Island challenge, I, I still think there are some other challenges that we could learn about, is uh, the contamination of groundwater by infiltrated stormwater. Maybe it applies a little bit more in Nassau County where they already have sewers, but I grew up and down the street from me was uh, something we called the sump. I didn't know it was a groundwater infiltration facility, but all the stormwater in my neighborhood recharged the aquifer. And from my experiences in Southern California, I don't think that sump was a great idea because it was just a giant sand basin. So I'd encourage you to look to examples like Adelaide, Australia, where they don't just build sand basins to infiltrate stormwater, they build constructed wetlands with vegetation. And those constructed wetlands are probably more effective at removing contaminants and improving water quality. And in my own research, we've been playing around with things like adding biochar and adding wood chips to wetlands to, to ramp them up and get them to do better work. So I'd encourage you to think about that because Adelaide already is relying on infiltrated stormwater for about 10% of their water supply. The last challenge that I thought of for Long Island, and maybe it sounds far-fetched to you, but that someday you might have a water shortage. You might have a drought. You might have population growth. You might have specific parts of the island where saline intrusions become an issue or where the climate changes enough that you have a shortage. You know, you had a period uh, a few summers ago where maybe it's still happening where in summertime, the demand on the, the municipal water supply was outstripping the ability of the wells to pump the water. I would pay attention to that because climate change came much faster in California than anyone expected. And when you run into this issue of water supply challenges and droughts, I'd encourage you to think about some of the ideas that are being pioneered elsewhere in the world, whether it's net zero uh, water buildings or potable water recycling facilities, or yes, even seawater desalination. You're ideally situated for seawater desalination uh, here on the island. And there's an added benefit that comes from this. And that is that if you could more efficiently recycle your water, that's less 
discharge, mass discharge of, of contaminants to the aquifer, you might find that some of that nitrogen, that excess nitrogen is fertilizing the lawn. You might find that, uh, that by putting more water into the system, by capturing storm water, which has lower nitrate concentrations, or even desalinating seawater, you might dilute some of that contamination that you're having trouble getting rid of. So in conclusion, uh, some final thoughts, and hopefully we have time for a little bit of discussion. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges we face in the water field is that we get locked in by the technology that our grandparents and great-grandparents built for us. Technology lock-in is incredibly difficult to break, either whether it's putting in sewers or ripping them out, getting rid of imported water systems or finding it after everyone else has grabbed it. That, that We have to keep that in mind, that revolutions require really big challenges. Evolution is much easier. Um, transformative technologies, whether they're, uh, uh, I don't know, harvesting of nutrients or, uh, or innovative and alternative septic systems, they merit subsidies in the early days and they should have safe places to play in niche markets with a plan that someday they'll become self-sustaining and self-supporting. So the idea of creating a, a revenue base for them so they can expand is fine, but in the early days, be prepared to pay more for them because they're gonna need it. And finally, returning to the six crises, not just the ones that are relevant for, for Long Island, um, we have the ability to fix every single water crisis we'll ever run into. It's a lack of will. And I think that lack of will can be traced back to the value with, in which we hold water. And I, I've been thinking a lot lately about things like uh, the human right to water, the rights of the environment to water, and the rights of future generations. That, that, that aren't making the decisions now. And I'd like to encourage you all, when you think about all of these issues, think about the future generations and think about making the water systems better than the ones you receive from your great grandparents. Give that legacy of an improved environment and more resilient water systems to the generations that follow us because our great grandparents did that for us. Uh, I want to have some acknowledgments so you can see the names of some of the people that have involved, involved in this research. I don't want to ignore them. The, the research I do is done by graduate students and postdocs, and the ideas are seeded by those same people plus some colleagues uh, and some of the institutions that have funded our work. Here's that uh, promised uh, uh, figure with the references in case anyone's interested in reading more. Or just search my name. It's unusual enough that you can find it. Um, and I'll just go back. Uh, yeah, I'll just stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. David, that was wonderful. So we're gonna take a few questions from the audience. Um, and as we see people who may have questions, I was just gonna ask you one there. And David, I was gonna ask, with regards to recycling the water and the, uh, the soup to keep you all in, what, what are the classic compounds that are both the most difficult, I guess, by then being expensive to make sure you're getting enough to ensure clean water? So in a system like the groundwater replenishment in Orange County, where you have reverse osmosis followed by an advanced oxidation process, it's historically been low molecular weight neutral compounds because they can diffuse through reverse osmosis membranes. So things like uh, n nitroso dimethylamine 1,4-dioxane, and it turned out actually the taste and odor compounds like jasmine and MIB were, were all issues. Um, they are the ones that determine the size of the advanced oxidation process needed afterwards. Um, in other parts of the country, for example, in Washington, D.C., and in Georgia, and in Colorado, there are potable water reuse projects that do not have a reverse osmosis membrane. And for those systems, it's turning out that uh, PFAS is one of the big drivers now of, of them because they, they burn through the carbon pretty quickly. Uh, we don't hear well. Yeah. 
Would that be expanded significantly to have a really significant impact on the value of the recovery? My, my answer is not now, but eventually. So what we have going on in California now is a tug of war about whether or not desalination is a legitimate technology for responding to droughts. And since California is the place with the biggest coastline, it's going to happen there. It's not going to happen at all. Um, about two weeks ago, the proposed desal plant at Huntington Beach was defeated uh, when the Coastal Commission ruled against it on the basis of damage it would cause to marine organisms. And we could talk about the underlying science behind that. But it was, I think, as much a political decision about, uh, about energy use uh, and the need to first recycle all of our wastewater before we turn to desal. So if I had a crystal ball here, I would say that, A, there's no city in the American Southwest that, that will ever run out of water. There's no Cape Town in the Southwest US, there are only farmers and rural communities will suffer water shortages. And B, um, if push came to shove, we, we build those seawater desal plants, but not yet. Um, I'm, I'll stick around like later and happy to talk to people. Well, I'll give you I'll give you a compelling example of, of why I know the salt machine is so necessary. The southern half of Florida relies upon brackish water desalination for their growth in water supply over these last 30 years. And the reason that they've been able to use it is something called the boulders formation, which is a thousand meter down, uh, very porous aquifer where they put their salt. Once you get beyond the part of the formation where the boulders zone is, um, you can't dispose of the concentrate anymore. And that's why Tampa built the, the, the desalination plant. And so it's pretty clear to me that if, if there was a way to get rid of the salt, they would have gone after the brackish water in the Florida aquifer. And so the new salt, the current salt machine tends to be something called a concentrator and a crystallizer. And that's a very thermodynamically intensive way to get rid of the residual water in the brine. It's like a multi, multi vapor compression uh, uh, approach, the way in which we make desalinated water on submarines super energy intensive and expensive, and then you have to crystallize it. What we're working on in NAWI are a range of technologies that uh, extend the, the limits of reverse osmosis. So right now, reverse osmosis can only get you to a certain recovery, uh, partially because of scaling, but partially because of uh, the osmotic pressure. So if you can make membranes that can tolerate higher pressures, you can use RO to go to higher water recoveries. There are other technologies like uh, uh, solvent extraction using things like uh, like dimethyl ether to extract uh, uh, water from salt solutions. They've been around for about 30 years, but if someone could push them over the edge, they might start to be competitive for brine treatment. So I, I think we need to drop the cost of getting brines all the way down to solid salts or almost solid salts by 40 or 50 percent. And once we do that, we're going to open up uh, a giant water resource. Thank the uh, joy we in thanking our uh, U.S. speaker, David. <laughs>